that into the the tutorials, but I have a built out uh, tutorial workbook. Um, it's literate code in Python uh, with the reactor data products. And, and this, this uh, shows you how to build a nuclear reactor data product. So this is all, it's all in the um, Markdown Python branch at the moment for the Terminus DB tutorials, but I'll, I'll get it merged back into main in a minute. Um, okay, so the, um, so this, this builds out all of, so it builds out a very complex data product essentially. So we have uh, the geo coordinates, we have um, units, so, because we have all kinds of units that are involved in describing a nuclear power plant. Uh, we have elements, so you might want to reference various different kinds of compounds, substances, um, isotopes, and elements when you're talking about various different nuclear reactors. Uh, and so then I have uh, ways of both building the uh, the ontologies or the schema um, programmatically, as well as uh, JSON files for some of the ones that are static. So you have, for instance, the geo coordinates are just a static description in JSON of what it means to be a geo coordinate and what it what a geo coordinates address will be once uh, once you've entered it. And some of them are more elaborate. So like the the um, the manner in which we build the elements is, is programmatic because we actually want to get an exhaustive list and I didn't want to write it by hand. So it's built up from uh, a CSV of all of the isotopes uh, that are known, their abundances, et cetera. And then once we've done all that, then we go through uh, and we there's a power production database, the global uh, database of power plants from the World Resources Institute. And I've just downloaded that uh, and I use it if, as a feed in to build out a data product that merges a lot of this information together. Um, and I've cleaned up some of the way that they represent things too. So they have kind of a messy representation. We have a much cleaner representation internally. And then you just, it just runs all of these things. And um, if you, if you, download the repository, you can just type make uh, nuclear and it'll make uh, the entire thing for you. And what it comes out like is this. So uh, this is the nuclear data product. So data products are listed on the left-hand side here. The branch that you're currently on is listed here. It says we're on the latest version of the main branch. So you can see there's time, time travel is built into the thing as well as you can change branches so the capacity factors branch is a derived branch that has information that's derived because there wasn't there weren't any capacity factors um, in the uh, original, uh, although the information necessary to calculate them was actually in the original data. So so if you look at the um, the schema page, so this this little uh, this guy here gives a, the schema page. And the schema page allows you to sort of browse through all the things that we've created. So we have dimensions. Uh, so the dimensions, it's interesting, I guess. You can see the, the values here. We have uh, currency, time, length, mass, uh, area, space, temperature, energy, power, force, torque, all the things that you might need to build up a unit system. So if you're doing dimensional analysis, it doesn't so much matter which unit you use, as long as you know what the unit is and that it has a, a commensurate um, dimension. And then you can do calculations with it. We also have like all of the elements um, and then of course, uh, all of the isotopes of all of the elements built in as well. Um, so then uh, we have countries. Now the countries were just generated based on what was uh, in that CSV file. But I figured we could have a more elaborate one that has uh, geo perimeters, et cetera. And I might, I might actually merge that into this in a subsequent tutorial that shows how to enrich a data product with uh, more information. Um, and then we have, uh, so units, units also, um, they have a number of properties including alternative names. Uh, it gives you, you some information about what the unit was derived from. So some units are derived, uh, for instance, the gram is actually derived from the kilogram, strangely enough, uh, just because they define the kilogram directly in, in the SI units. 
Um, and so you can see what things are derived from. You can tell what their dimension is. The dimension is an enum. Uh, it has to be one of the known dimensional types. Um, and then we have substances. Substances are a super type of compounds, elements, or isotopes. Compounds uh, can point to the elements of which they are made, as, as well as having a chemical formula. A and elements, they um, have atomic number, element name, element symbol, and a list of uh, isotopes, because they, each one has, you know, may have multiple isotopes. And then the isotope class. And finally, we have um, we have a nuclear power plant. And a nuclear pl power plant is not actually the same thing as a reactor. And if we look over at relationships here, we can see that a nuclear power plant points to reactors. Uh, so there's some number of uh, reactors which might be pointed to, because um, some some like um, uh, Bruce Power in Canada. Yeah, I don't know if you know that one, but it it has a huge number of reactor cores. So you can you can have loads of them. Um, and I also have power reactors, experimental reactors, and research reactors uh, segregated. So uh, then we come to the actual document view. So the document view gives you some information about all of the classes that are inside of uh, a data product on a particular um, branch of the data product. So you may have different uh, elements in different branches because you may be enriching it, or you may have uh, reduced branches that only have information that is uh, for export to other people, and you might want to hide some things behind or, or whatever. But you can switch quickly between the various different branches and see what's in them. It tells you something about like the, the volumes of the uh, that are in these. So in terms of nuclear power plants, uh, we have 205. And so we can see very quickly you know, the country list, we have Argentina, Armenia, blah, blah, blah. So you actually get to see all of the countries that have uh, nuclear power plants. The units, we just have uh, the units that I needed in order to, to make this work. But you could enrich the unit system depending on what you needed. Um, so you know you might want to know about what the original cost in US dollars or pounds or euros was for some particular um, uh, example so i don't have any compounds but i do have elements and the elements also so for instance barium uh, has atomic number 56 gives you its element symbol and then a list of all the isotopes uh, of barium that are known we also have uh, so we can go i don't have any experimental reactors built in yet i actually um i will do in a subsequent tutorial uh re-tagging of some of these from uh, as experimental reactors. But we do have nuclear power plants. Uh, so you can see here, because we have very deep sub-documents, uh, the UI needs to change a little bit uh, in order to accommodate these very deep ones. I think when we were building it, we didn't have uh, data products built out that were this large. But a nuclear power plant uh, is, is basically composed of uh, commissioning year, country. Um, this is in ID number of the global power uh, plant database. Um, and then you also have things like its location. Uh, in, and then we have um, the annual output. So this is quite cool. You can see here for the year 2015, uh, we had um, 15,802 gigawatt hour output uh, for this power plant, which is the ASCO GR which is in uh, Argentina, I believe. So if we go to the bottom, it's Endesa Generacion. Um, is a Spanish, uh, sorry, it's a Spanish one. So yeah, so this is for, for Spain, country Spain. So you can see it's uh, in the country Spain. And if you look at the JSON, this is what you would get back programmatically. So uh, you have something that's quite readable that then you can use in your processing system. And in the tutorial, I have an example where I pull out these. So uh, where, where is it? So the output is actually a list of objects. And in that list of objects, you have an, a year and the quantity of output for that year. And using that together with the, um, with the capacity number, so there's a capacity which is 1990 uh, megawatt electric. So using that, we can calculate what the, what the uh, capacity factor is. So how much 
of the uh, nameplate is actually being generated. It's quite interesting, actually, because uh, you get really big numbers for nuclear power plants. The, some of them are, I think the lowest I saw was 45, but there's a very large number that are running at over 90% capacity, which is quite quite interesting. It's much higher than coal or oil plants tend to be. So, um, so that's uh, that sort of gives a, a quick overview, I guess, of the of what was built out. Um, so, are there any questions about the the data products that people have? Uh, it's an observation that boy, this is a a KPI uh, aficionado's dream. You know, what I mean? <laughs> in terms of the just in terms of even the uh, reports, right? You, you just it's all dynamic, right? You know, that's right. Yeah. Oh my God, those guys! They it'd be an unending uh, cornucopia of of data for these guys. I mean, the executive suites would absolutely it'd be jaw dropping for them because you know th this kind of stuff. They those reports are always you know it's some kind of a SAP type system or whatever, and it's all you know custom made every damn time, right? And takes that forever and all that stuff. And from an accounting standpoint, oh my God, can you imagine tying into to ledgers it's just amazing you know yeah, that's, I mean, that's the hope and, and the dream right is that we can yeah. get to a point where we can build these data as a product so it's surfaced in a way that's already quite easy to use and then you can use it programmatically or you can view it and if you if you like uh, in any of these things we can um you know we can uh, since we're in the document viewer so if we go to a nuclear power plant and say we click on this guy osco Oh, this guy's too big. <laughs> we actually need to work on the the UI a little bit here. So let me see if I can find one that has less data. Atuki. No, that's also too large. No worries. Um, so yeah, I could go to a unit. Maybe is a better example. There we go. So we can edit these things as well. So you can get in and you can edit the definitions of this guy. So you can either do it in the JSON or you can do it in a nice user interface. So you can see if we wanted to add another, so if we go to the form, so we can select uh, in this form and actually build up a, uh, a uh, the objects manually. Sorry, I blew out there. So this is still in beta, by the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a few hiccups here and there. No worries. This is... The potential is just massive. This is such a smart move going with this uh, document API stuff. This is going to be so much more approachable for some people. I mean, it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it also it just totally. I, I love the idea of of not being uh, hamstrung by uh, as much as you know the as much as Owl two is is powerful. It's it's still an open ended problem. So now That's you can, right. yeah. can close. This is great. Ha. Huh. Oh, yeah, so you can yeah. see, you know, all of these things being editable, and you don't necessarily have to be a programmer in order to do curation. You can just do it in the. We want to make it so that we can empower people to do curation manually when necessary, and make it easy to do it programmatically for large data sets. Oh, when you talk about real time with our stuff, with the entities and so forth, or linked data. The, the opportunity here to just dynamically move around in terms of natural language processing and understanding is, is going to be real time. So it, I, got, I can hardly wait to tie, tie into you guys. This is just good. <laughs> oh, we are going to have some. This is a brilliant stuff. Congrats to everybody. This is amazing. Wow. Thank you, Brad. My, my mind is blown. I, you know, don't forget, I've been. It's been two decades. Well, you guys too. You know, this is decades to see this kind of stuff come come to power. And I would have never guessed, but I guess Prolog is the the key language for the for the expressiveness here. It's incredible. It Always had a suspicion. It was just that it, it, you know Prolog's been around so long. People always assume that there's better things that evolved, but they all got object oriented and screwed up. Well, it certainly makes constraint checking uh, easier to write. That's oh, that's one God. thing I will say for it. <laughs> no, oh, incredible. Wow. Yeah? Yeah, what do you do with it? 
Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, so in the enrichment section, like I, I haven't got to the uh, querying section. I'm still in the middle of writing that. But you can see in the enrichment section that our enrichment is based on the data that's already in there. So basically what you do is, you know, you connect to the the uh, Terminus TB or Terminus uh, Hub and, or Terminus X, sorry, the uh, cloud version. And then you can um, you can actually do things like create and delete branches. So here I'm creating a branch. And when I create that branch, I branch from what I had connected to, which was the original data product. And I'm creating a branch because what I want to do is I want to enrich it, but I don't want to pollute the original one. Later, if this turns out to be a good enrichment and it's been quality checked, et cetera, then I can do a rebase on top of main. Or it might be that I always want to keep this segregated. And one of the reasons for derived data to be segregated is that ground truth is always, um, it can be easier to establish if you actually kick this off in some kind of CI, CD process. So continuous integration, continuous development. If you've written the script that generates it, sometimes it's better to just keep the uh, core information from which things are generated separate. Then when you change the core information, the derived information automatically gets updated correctly. Um, and this can be a, a little bit of a problem with triggers, but with branches, you, you have a way around it. So basically, uh, I query the database for the a document, and we have a simple query uh, document query interface that allows you to specify the aspects of the document that you want. In this case, I'm just looking for a type. Uh, and this type it will encompass everything that is a nuclear power plant. So anything below it in the hierarchy will also be uh, will also be obtained. Then I can just take these plants that I've got out of this thing and I can loop over them. And it's actually, uh, you know, it's an iterator. So you can take each one of them, you can loop over it. Then I want to get a quantity of, and so what this does is it just is for checking to make sure that uh, my units are correct. I was thinking about integrating it into a Python uh, library that does uh, dimensional analysis because you could do this in an automated way. But um, I didn't want people to have to install another Python library. So uh, basically, what we do is we just check uh, that the quantity is of the unit that we say it is. Um, you could also write one that does conversions between the various different units. And that would be very cool, uh, as long as the dimension is correct. Um, and we, we loop over that. And then we, we uh, look at the output of a power plant. Now, all, not all of the power plants have listed output data, so we have to check to make sure it has listed output data. And then uh, we go through the output by year, um, and we calculate the, we look at the total gigawatt hours, um, and then we calculate a capacity factor by uh, uh, dividing it by the nameplate capacity multiplied by the number of um, the number of uh, hours in a day, number of days in a year, and that gives us an annual total expected uh, maximum output. And then since we're dividing by that, that gives us the capacity factor. So the capacity factor will be some number between zero and one, um, unless things are really strange and you've over-generated, but I've never seen that happen uh, on, a <laughs> on an annual basis. It wouldn't be very likely, but you often get numbers in the realm of 9D or so. And then once you've got that, then we enrich the document with the capacity factor, uh, and then we just update the plant. And uh, you know we just send it back um, to uh, Terminus X, and Terminus X updates that document. Now you could uh, collect them all and do it all in one go as well. And that would be a little bit more efficient and faster. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to see each plant being updated as I was running it because it's more fun that way. So that's that gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can. <laughs> but so yeah, that's that's how I imagine you know uh, we we're going to be using this a lot is that you know you query for documents that have some specific shape and you can just put the shape in here. Uh, specifying the parts of the document that you you want to extract, and then you get the document. Uh, you you pull out the elements from it. It's very easy to use in some language like Python or JavaScript because they have native dictionaries, and what you're getting back is just a native dictionary. So it's quite easy to to manipulate.